Hi everyone, I'm Kelly Delaney from the Drupal Association and I'm the Director of Development and this is my co-host. Hi there folks, I'm Nathan Roach, the Marketing Director at Accelerant. This is Beyond the Build, Stories of Drupal Impact, where we'll be highlighting incredible Drupal use cases by ambitious site builders and end users, just like we have on today. Great, Kelly, who are we speaking with today? We have a longtime Drupal partner called Anertech out of Ireland and their client, University of Limerick. Great, let's welcome them in. Hey, Mark and Bren. Hi. Hey, folks. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Thanks so much for joining us. Um, uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourselves, what you do uh, at your organizations? Mark, why don't we start with you? Sure. Yeah, my name is Mark. I've got the same job title as Kelly, Director of Development, uh, except at Anertech instead of the Drupal Association. Uh, in Anertech, we, we, the company kind of has three departments. So we've got the Department of, kind of Development or Projects. Uh, support and managed services and then business development and account management. So I lead, I lead the development part, basically any kind of uh, new websites being built or, or kind of are very large projects for, for current clients. I, I take the lead on, on those. Um, much more a front end developer than back end developer uh, with a history as a, an English teacher. Most people in Anertech and most, oh. people, most people I know in Drupal <laughs> uh, don't have histories in computer science or software development and t things like that. Oh, great. Awesome. And, and Bren, how about yourself? Hi, folks. So, yeah, I'm the web manager at the University of Limerick, which is a university in the southwest of Ireland. Um, I run a web team there, um, and we basically are responsible for maintaining most of the web presence, uh, the corporate website and ancillary sites around that. So that's kind of our, our role. Um, we have, we're kind of split among UX people, content people, and, and development um, my background, I was actually a developer myself and started using Drupal around about Drupal 6, uh, but I've since kind of moved into the management side of things, so I'm a lapsed developer, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Great. C could you tell us a little bit about the relationship between the University of Limerick and Anertech? How did this all get started? Um, well, I guess um, for myself, there was a, a personal relationship with Anertech because I I used to work for many years in the UK, um, but then I moved back to Ireland and I actually worked with Anertech for 18 months before I took up my position at the University of Limerick. So I was a project manager for Anertech and I got to see the company from the inside out and uh, had a great time and I still kept good relationships with the company. Um, and then when I moved to the University of Limerick, it was already using Drupal. So my experience in Drupal kind of dovetailed with that as well. You had mentioned that the the relationship between the University of Limerick and Drupal predates you, right? Far before. Do you, do you, do you sure. know about how Drupal was selected or anything about why Drupal is the product of choice or platform of choice for the university? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I mean, it does predate me, but I think it was first introduced around 2012, I think. Um, and I think there was a process, an evaluation process at that point uh, around technologies that the university might use. And uh, Drupal came out on the top of that list, I guess. But it was kind of, um, there was no real central governance of web creation at the university at the time. So it was a recommended technology that people could go and get an agency to build a site for them. Um, but there was no kind of coherent um, control over that development at the time, uh, which led to a proliferation of sites, really. Um, and then, yeah, I joined in 2018, uh, to manage the central web team that would put some sort of governance around the, the creation of sites because it had spiraled up to hundreds and with no governance and no uh, consistency across them. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Drupal is very flexible and many different agencies built the site and they built many different things. So uh, we needed to kind of try and rationalize that, that build. Uh, still, still, but Drupal is our preferred technology, obviously, but to put some, yeah, put some control on, on what was happening. Uh, you had mentioned that this was a big migration project when you started working with Mark just recently. So you had said it kind of started as an emergency. You had some comp compliance and accessibility issues that made you need to migrate from Drupal 7 to 9. Could you tell us about that? Sure. Um, so um, as I said, when we, when we f web team was first created in 2018, uh, we became this uh, central unit for, for, um, governance of the web. And the first thing we did was we created a central platform, a Drupal 7 platform, and we tried to migrate as many of these uh, isolated Drupal instances as we could in there, kind of prioritizing the, the, the uh, 
uh, higher value sites that would be of value to our users. And over time, this was a Drupal 7 build, we migrated about uh, 50 sites into that. Uh, but it was kind of, it, it was still a kind of an older build and kind of uh, not an ideal solution, but at least it gave us some kind of central governance and, and homogeneity around what we were doing and, and consistency of presentation. But um, one of the difficulties it had was that uh, authors still had a, a large degree of freedom of what they could add to the site. And what we found was we found proliferation of cookies in particular. People were embedding all sorts of things that the system wasn't really catering for, things like Google Maps, which would set cookies. And also there was no real uh, accessibility built into the platform. And in the last few years, certainly in Ireland, the, both the regulators on around uh, cookies and around accessibility have really emphasized the need for compliance. And we came to a situation where we got compliant, especially on cookies, and then because of the diverse nature, and it was actually a site that hadn't been migrated yet, we went out of compliance and we got a notification that we had two weeks to get back into compliance, which we did, but at that point we realized that this was not sustainable and we really, really needed to upgrade our platform. Drupal 7 was at that time going to be end of life anyway in 2022, and that changed after. So we initiated a kind of an emergency procedure to get ourselves onto Drupal 9 and to build in compliance for cookies and accessibility as much as we possibly could into that platform. And that's what we did. Brent, two weeks or what? What would happen in two weeks? <laughs> um, you, yeah, the, the, I think the technical term is enforcement. <laughs> um, you could be fined, basically, is what it boils down to. Um, and they have, I mean, the regulators have fined. I mean, we saw today that uh, Meta but the Irish regulator has got 1.2 billion as of a fine around GDPR. It's the same regulator and the Data Protection Commissioner. But yeah, I mean, they, they, they really just emphasize that we, we have a legal requirement to be compliant with this stuff. And, you know, we, we needed to make sure that we were adhering. Now, by and large, we, we had been compliant. It was just that there was a kind of a, an ancillary site that had been picked up that wasn't compliant. So, yeah. But it, it did highlight the fact that we couldn't contain, we couldn't continue with this diverse ecosystem. And we also needed to upgrade the central platform. So there was kind of two Two birds we wanted to kill with one stone, really. I mean, anybody who works in the higher education sector, this won't be an unfamiliar uh, landscape to them. Most of the people I've talked to in Ireland and the UK and abroad have this ecosystem of hundreds of sites that have built up. And a lot of people are struggling trying to maintain that, maintain compliance, maintain governance o over that. So it's, it's, it's a common problem, I think. That, yeah, Mark, have you seen that other places too? I think you mentioned another higher ed college and what was the, also the first thing that you did when you came in and you heard that? <laughs> was it like, hurry up and do yeah. a million things at once? You came uh, in under the gun. Uh, well, we, yeah, there's, there's a slight part of the story with, with Bren. The, the emergency fix for the cookies was was really a kind of a two week last minute job. and. I remember Bren was Jeff Stella, the director of uh, managing director here in Anertech, and I had written a suite of, of modules for for GDPR for Anertech that we can roll out across all of our clients, and it was very, very uh, helpful. Let's say so. When Bren was Jeff Stella, we thought, yeah, we can get this fixed, but we kind of had until Monday or something to get it fixed, and we started on it was a Thursday evening. So uh, <laughs> myself said yeah. I had a pretty cool weekend <laughs> that weekend, and we, we we got it done. I, I, you know, I think I think Bren and UL were pretty happy with with the speed we could work and the, and and you know that we were willing to kind of take some time out of private lives and and make sure that they didn't did get didn't get kind of hammered by the by the DPO. In fairness, I think to the the, the, the data protection um, commission, I think they're they're fairly uh, decent. I know they can give you a fine of. Was it twenty million or four percent of your turnover, whichever is the larger? But I, I think they would work with you and give you, a, you know, a notice first and a warning next, and that. Um, but yeah, that, that was the first thing was get get all the cookies, and it was really hard actually to find find them because you're looking at a couple of hundred Drupal websites, you think, but there's also some WordPress ones, and there was also some Joomla ones, and there was some custom builds, and we found a WordPress website inside a Drupal website at one stage. Um, and, and and some of the websites we just we just couldn't get access to parts of the code base because there were there were an external agency who would you know maybe not working anymore or, or, or whatever like that. Uh, so there was a lot of kind of digging around through the, the, the job itself wasn't very hard, but there was thousands of bits to the job to, to, to get it finished. That sounds like an Easter egg hunt. <laughs> yeah, how, how do you tackle that, right? I mean, like, what, what do you start with? I mean, you have multiple sites and, you know, using different CMSs. Mm -hmm. How do you begin? Um, from, from my point of view, I'll let Brendan speak about how, how maybe they, they diagnosed issues themselves. From our point of view, I had written a module called uh, ANRT, that's our short name for Anertech, ANRT GDPR. 
uh, and that had some custom templates around YouTube and and um, uh, cookie controls uh, uh, software like CookieBot or OneTrust and, and those kinds of things. Um, so at, we we had rolled that out to about seventy different websites in Anertech, and I had done that in maybe a month or so. So I was I was fairly confident that hey, I I understand kind of cookies at scale. Let's let, let's call it. Um, so from my point of view, I I, I could I could very easily isolate. Uh, YouTube templates and Vimeo templates, SoundCloud templates, um, where something might get added via uh, a Facebook uh, tracking cookie or tracking pixel or something rather than uh, an iframe with, with, with some 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 uh, JavaScript that this pulls in externally and things like that. Uh, I think Bren kind of got us at the right time. If, if he had asked us to do this before we'd had the Anatech GDPR internal project, it, were, could, it could, could have been a two-month project. But since we've done so much work for 70 other clients, we kind of... You kind of piggybacked on, on all that knowledge. Yeah, and, and from our side, I mean, it, it was a tremendous amount of work to get back into compliance, but it also highlighted that this was just merely a sticky plaster on the existing system. And it really, it, it, I mean, we always had plans to upgrade anyway, because obviously Drupal 7 was as a technology that's, that's ending its life. But it really cemented for us that we, we could slip out of compliance, despite all the work that had been done because of the way that the systems were put together and built. We could slip out of compliance very easily again and, and not realize it. So we put a bit more governance around our, our cookie management processes, but we still then at that point said we really need to rebuild the system here, uh, build a clean system, bring content into it that we can control how people create that content. Uh, and it's, it's not about controlling them and forcing them to do things, to assist them into being compliant without them having to think about it really. So that, that, that sticky pastor exercise really cemented this, our, our, our need to straight away build a new system, basically, and migrate content into that. So after this emergency happened, then did you and your team, Bren, go to the drawing board and decide, yes, we need to contact an agency? Did you go through a selection process or did you know you wanted to go right back to Intertech? Yeah. No, we, we went through a selection process. So um, we're a public body, so we, have to, we can't just uh, appoint people. But, uh, we have to go through a whole process around that. It's called procurement. Um, in this case, it was a much quicker process. We did a kind of a, a very abbreviated procurement process, but we still did. We, we contacted multiple companies. They had to submit proposals and then a panel um, uh, evaluated those proposals. And I actually didn't sit on that panel because because uh, I had worked for Anertex, so I didn't want to have any you know, association with it. So that panel evaluated them and Anertex came out as a clear winner. Uh, so yeah, that's how, that's how they got appointed. So where are you in the process, Mark? So you're doing a, this large migration. I know you have 50 sites that you've migrated to Drupal 9. Is, is, are you still in the middle of this, of all the updates? No, that's, that's, that part is finished. So we, there, was, there was a couple of platforms. Brent can correct me if I'm wrong about it. There, there was a couple of platforms. So one was they had migrated about 50 websites into this central uh, platform, but there were still 50 individual inst installations of Drupal, let's say. And then there's another platform that's a multi-site, which has maybe 35 or 40 installations. And then there's what I might call the Wild West, which is <laughs> the, rest, the rest of the websites that, that are kind of out, outside of both of these areas. So, so phase one was to migrate those 50 websites into one Drupal uh, installation. So now when, when you want to update a module or there's a security release for Drupal, you don't have to update 50 different websites. We update one website and that carries out across the, across the board. Yeah, from, from our side, yeah, it was a, the initial migration project was that that central system that we had kind of standardized on and we had about 50 sites on that. Um, and I think the numbers, I have the numbers here in front of me, I think there was 60,000 nodes, 70 content types, 95 paragraph types, 60 vocabularies, 37,000 individual migration processes. That's the numbers and what it took to migrate that central system. But then we had about another 120 odd sites, 70 of which actually were in one system, and uh, a Drupal 7 multi-site system, which was built in um, by an agency way back in the days, and it didn't use any of the Drupal 7 inbuilt multi-site uh, ways of building a site, they did something very strange and bespoke. But yeah, so since that central system that Anertech built for us has been built and it was completed, I think, start of the year, we've been migrating more and more sites into that. So our, our numbers are down now. Of the 70 sites on that other multi-site, I think we've only got about 15 left to migrate in. Uh, and I think we've only got about another 20 maybe other sites to come in. So we've really, uh, we've really pushed to migrate the content in, but the new system wasn't just about um, creating a Drupal 9 site that was compliant, we also added new editor tools on top of that, and it's made migrating that content much easier. 
Uh, and I guess Mark can talk about that. We're using Layout Builder for us previously. We were using Paragraphs. So the actual migration process for our content editors, they find it much quicker to add content in now. And we're still not completed that, that um, migration process, but we're a long way down the line on, on it now. Um, so it's not automated uh, creation anymore as it was in the migration process. It's manual, taking an old site, bringing the content across, evaluating the content, bringing it across. But it's proving very rapid now with the, with the new system, which we're very pleased the, with. The, um the ease of content editor experience, Brent, it's not, I suppose, specifically just because we use Layout Builder uh, rather than Paragraphs. Because if we had created 90 layout blocks, <laughs> you'd still have the same issue with 90 kind of paragraph mm-hmm. types. Um, but there, there was a huge rationalization process that went on there as well that um, things had kind of grown organically in that if somebody had an, an image paragraph type and then somebody else said, but I want to have text beside my image, well, then somebody created another image with text paragraph type and somebody else said, I want to have a, a, my image be clickable as a link. So then there was another one, which was a, a linked image paragraph type. So you, myself and Sean, one of the project managers in, in Anatech, we spent, I think, three weeks or thereabouts full time doing absolutely nothing. And I mean, nothing. It was really, really boring, uh, except looking at what we call the spreadsheet of doom. So the, the spreadsheet of doom was was the, the 70 uh, content types on one sheet and the 90 paragraph types on another and then a matrix that creates a a sheet for every single configuration of these and then so so we we got things in like getting back to the image example there was an image there was an image with text there was an image with link there was an image with something 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 so they all became the image block so now when you create the image block if you want the link pop in an image and pop in a link if you want some text beside it pop in that if you want it left or right select the alignment uh, features and things like that. So we, we did a lot of work with, with, with that kind of um, uh, rationalization of things. So there, we got down to, I think, from, oh, I don't know, was it 30, 40 content types down to maybe 15, 20, and from 90 paragraph types to maybe 25, 30 uh, block types. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the, 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 it also, I mean, it, it changed the architecture of the site as well in that central system because previously it was a multi-site, so we had about 50 sites, but they were their own individual sites with individual databases and the ability to override the theme and add in their own modules and create their own components. And that's why that, that spread kind of happened over time. But in the new system, it's actually only one site. It's one Drupal site and they're all using these the exact same components, but we use groups to section the site out now. So if you're a member of a group in a department or a faculty, you can edit content in your own group, but you're all using the exact same components as everybody else using the site, which has made the governance much, much easier for us. It's also meant that things like compliance being built in is much, much uh, easier. It's simpler. You're not having to be compliant across 95 different block types or paragraph types. You've got the same blocks and components for everybody. So yeah, it's really made things much better. I, I think, Brent, Brent what th- there have was you a, heard? Yeah. Oh. Oh, sorry, sorry okay. no, just, just following <laughs> on with what yeah. Brent said, there, there was a kind of a sea change, I think, internally for you guys as well, that in, in terms of the governance, because it was so easy for anybody in, say, Department of Economics to say, I want a new call to action. And, mm-hmm. and somebody else could say, no, you can't have that. But of course we can, it's our own website. Whereas now you must justify the new feature you want to be available across every single website in this whole uh, web web, web um, uh, uh, setup, and if if you can't justify it for everybody, are you sure that we really need it on this one website? And and it's it's become I think from from the management point of view, and I don't want to speak for you, let's say, but from the management point of view, it's easier to say it's easier mm-hmm. to say no now, and it's easier to have have an, an overarching kind of content strategy around that 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 was much much more difficult uh, in in the other setup. Exactly, and it it has it has an interesting kind of knock on effect then that. Um, because all our editors, so basically we have a central web team that does kind of a certain amount of the content, but we have such a big organization that we have distributed editors in their own departments and areas, taking care of content relevant to their own area. But because they're all using the same system now and they have the common, same common problems, it makes it easier for us to diagnose, but it also makes it easier to train them and it makes it easier for them to cross communicate with each other. So it's, it's kind of a, a community of editors now as opposed to before because they might be using similar but slightly different components um, there was no commonality, really. So now, as well as the website being common now, the, the methods of creation and the training and the documentation is all unified. Kelly, you Thank had you something know. you wanted no. to ask? You, no. the, he, well, they I, answered it. <laughs> so you're talking about centralizing digital experiences, not just from the development point of view, but also from the content publishing point of view as well with one centralized strategy and a means of ensuring that that is 
uh, compliant, not just in terms of regulation, but also in terms of what the University of Limerick is looking to do with their platform. Why Drupal? Were there alternatives? Um, Were there discussions? How in the end was it decided? We're going from D7, we're going to D9, and we're staying with Drupal. Sure. I mean, there's, there's a few drivers in that. I mean, the obvi- one of the obvious ones is that Drupal is a technology that we've been using since 2012. We know it, we trust it, um, we have experience in it, we have, you know, not, not just experience in using it, but we have got a certain amount of development capacity ourselves around it. Um, but the fundamental thing with Drupal for us is its flexibility. Um, Drupal is tremendously flexible. Um, uh, we would have a number of back-end systems, for example, we would like to integrate with. Um, and if we were going with a, a bespoke system, you know, we'd, we don't know if we would have the flexibility to integrate with those. But we can do that with Drupal and we can do it ourselves um, reasonably easily if we know, if we know the technologies. Um, and yeah, we need that flexibility. Obviously, Drupal is open source as well. And we're a university. We like the, f- the fundamental philosophy of open source. It kind of aligns with our <laughs> our goals uh, and our, our view of the world, so that that's that's very important for us. And things like the open web and things like that, Drupal is a great contributor to that. And yeah, so really, it's a technology that that we that we trust, that we believe in, and that gives us the things that we need. Um, and that's why we, we we continue to stay with it. Mark, any thoughts on that? Um, from our point of view, it it, w- it was a no brainer to to use Drupal. Um, well, I mean, you know, the, the, the tender document had stipulated they needed Drupal anyway. So in, in that case, but in, in any case, we, we would have used Drupal for something like this specifically because of the content modeling capabilities. Um, within the university, you got fairly complex sit, set up in terms of uh, departments and sub-departments uh, um, and staff and, uh, you know, the mar- marketing kind of ancillary, not just the teaching, teaching areas, um, marketing staff and things like that. Uh, the data model that goes with that in terms of tagging content that, that one piece of content can lie in more than one one section of the website. That's that's pretty complex, and that's hard to do in something like WordPress, or hard to do in in if certainly if you're going to write your own as a, a I don't know some sort of a JavaScript front end or using using something like Sanity or that, uh, that would be very difficult. So for us, it was really the the, the content modeling experience, um, the the ability to create content types, the ability you know the how taxonomy works in Drupal for for categorizing and stuff, and uh, the group module then was was the kind of the killer selling point for us that uh, you, you, you get a lot of um, a lot of websites where say you might have a lot of editors and some editors are news editors so they can only edit news posts and somebody is an events editor and you know they can edit the events section when it comes to university you got news posts inside departments so you got a news editor but you want them to only edit news inside uh, the, the department of of uh, business or only edit news inside sports science department or something like that uh, so, so the group module allowed us to do that—that that you could section off as part of the website, so someone could get. There could be a, a, a there could be an administrator on on one website in UL, and there might only be a, a, a visitor on another website, and there could be an editor on a different website, and, and to be able to do all that and do that for free, let's say, as in you know a, a free open source product, that, that that's amazing. You know, you get get ready to pay a couple of million euros for someone to to write a custom uh, feature set for you to do that. So even just the group module part of it, it was like this one aspect that was, yeah, it's already open source, it's already there, you didn't have to pay for it, and it just made the world of difference with this instance. Yeah, yeah, because so if you look at the, the old UL website, and there's uh, the science and engineering department, and then there's the business department, and then there's the global, we'll say the, the, the main website, there's news that could be posted from the main website inside one of those departments as well. But since they're all individual Drupal installations, they've all got their own URLs. So you've got three different URLs. Now, that's pretty tricky to handle three different URLs for the same piece of content inside one website on its own. But something like Group Module allows us to create the, the, the news in one place and add it to this group and add it to this group and add it to this group. Awesome. And each individual group then becomes becomes its own individual website inside inside UL. It's, it's very, very simple. It, it might sound Amazing. like a, like a bit, mm-hmm. oh, wow, that's, that's very um, complex. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really simple to do <laughs> in, 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 in Drupal. Cool. Uh, well, tell us about how, how's the project going now? Where are you almost done with it? Or are you still in the middle of migrating or what's ha- happening? So um, we're still, so the project itself, so the platform is built I and mean, we're constantly okay. improving it and, and, and looking for ways to make it better. But um, so we're, we're still migrating content okay. um, and that will continue through the summer. We're hoping to finish. I mean, we, we've said the deadline is November 
2023 because that's end of life triple seven <laughs> um, we're hoping to finish before then but we'll see um we're pushing towards that um and then i guess for us then a lot of it is around then seeing was it successful you know because we had certain goals at the start of the project um and we're quite happy that we're the, the project has fulfilled those goals for us. We, we're, in, we're compliant in terms of um, cookies so far. We haven't dropped out of compliance yet. We, we keep monitoring that. Our accessibility of the site is is really, really good. Um, we there's, um, there's a technology called Silk Tide, which is one of the accessibility tools you can you can have. And they have they have a, they have various links running where you can monitor sectors and they monitor the Irish university sector. And we're currently the number one site for accessibility on that site. And that's that's for the new site. Now, we still have some of the older sites that are not accessible, but once they're migrated in, we'll get all the benefits in the new site. So, I mean, once our migrations are complete, we're, we're very happy that the platform has given us what we've asked for it, really. Can you tell us a little bit about moving from paragraphs to layout builder? Um, you mentioned about 100 paragraph types to about 20 block types. Could you speak a bit about that? Who is you? <laughs> oh, I should specify. Why don't Why don't we start with with you, Bren, and then Mark? You can color sure. in any uh, gaps there. Is that good? Okay. Sure. Yeah. No bother. Um, so yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, I don't do much content editing now. <laughs> I'm not the target audience for the interface. But um, so paragraphs were great. Uh, to be fair, you know, they they served us well. But the interface for adding paragraphs isn't very visual. You get a kind of a, a set of uh, fields really that you can see what's been added to the paragraph but it's not very visual whereas with layout builder it's a very visual way of creating content you can create sections you can create um, a number of columns in a section for example and then you can position blocks in drag and drop them around the place uh, and kind of get a preview of what your web page is going to look like which you you, you didn't get with paragraphs um, so that, that's really good for our editors because you know I mean while, while some of us will have a lot of Drupal experience a lot of the editors won't they're just using a web interface they don't understand the technology behind that all they know is that they want to their web page look a certain way. So, one of the one of the kind of drivers as well for us is to try and make our editors' lives as easy as possible, and having a very visual representation of how they create their content, uh, and and to allow them to create really you can create really quite complex layouts in terms of regions and columns and different different numbers of columns and columns and regions. They can do that pretty easily uh, with Layout Builder. And it also gives us, as the kind of central team, a certain amount of control as well to stop them doing things that we might necessarily want them to do. So it allows to, to create a kind of a flexible platform that's regulated, I would say. And yeah, whereas with Paragraphs, we didn't really get that in our own system. Mark probably would have a, a more technical answer than that. I do actually. Um, like a, a lot of the websites we build are, are pretty complex in Anertech. And what we find with uh, something like Paragraphs was... If there's if there's four items in play at the same time, it gets very very hard to, hard to do. So if if the website is multilingual, and you need revisions for your pages, and uh, oh god, I had all a second ago there. Multilingual plus revisions plus uh, nested paragraphs. So you know a paragraph container and then items inside it, plus one other thing. And if those four things uh, align together, it's really really difficult. When we use Layout Builder, since it's built into Drupal Core, all of those problems were solved. We didn't we didn't have those issues because it's it's it, it gets the full test suite that uh, Drupal Core has and it's so it's much better tested for uh, does it work with with core revisions does it work with multilingual does it work with oh that was uh, workflows uh, uh, scheduling uh, sch scheduling as well uh, when we didn't work with Layout Builder in that case it was very very tricky and we ended up using kind of hacks to get around things like inline entity form so things weren't actually nested to our, their own custom i know i get a little bit technical custom entities but we had to do that with a lot of extra patches uh we even went to one of our clients and told them here based on what we've done with ul your experience is going to be 10 times better if you and it, it wasn't a huge mission for us to change and, and migrate their stuff back into into the kind of ul approach um so yeah with, with, with an anatech we're doing our best to Use as much Drupal core as possible, rather than than uh, contra modules that, that that come in come into the ecosystem. Mark, that's a great way to kind of bring it all back. Like all the stuff you do with Drupal, all the other projects. How do you think all that background knowledge um, brought value to this project with University of Limerick? Uh, I, I I hope it brought a lot. Um, the, the the amount of of contrib modules on the University of Limerick website is pretty small at the moment. Like you're, you're talking maybe 15 or 20, maybe thereabouts contrib modules. When we started the project, there was maybe uh, 70, 90, 100 contrib modules. 
So we've, we've really worked hard to, to, to build things with Drupal Core itself and its, and its yeah. core features and, and the test suite that comes with that. Uh, I think when you get uh, developers maybe not as experienced as Anertech, you, you would look at going, oh, there's a module for that, so let's just plug it in and let's just plug it in and let's plug it in, which is fine and it gets all the things you want done, but it can start slowing down your site and it can bring in compliance issues and it can bring scalability issues and, and that. Uh, trying to keep the core as small as possible and then uh, work at the team layer is is is, is how we, we would do a lot of our work. Awesome. Brian, do you have anything to add to that to wrap up? Um, well, I think it, it kind of goes back again, talking about adding in contrib modules. When people come and ask us for stuff that we could kind of solve by putting in a contrib module, we always have to think that it's not just affecting that person who's asked us, it's affecting the whole site. Yeah. Um, so we really have to evaluate whether that's going to bring benefit to everybody, what's the what's the negative things it might have around performance or an extra layer of maintenance and things like that. So we're really quite keen to run a kind of a lean ship, really. And you get an awful lot from Drupal, from the core and, and, and a minimal number of modules without having to introduce any extra complexity. Now, there will be cases where you know, you will need maybe another contribute module, but you, you need to go into that, and we need to go into that with our eyes wide open about what it'll cost us mm -hmm. down the line. So we try not to do it. Mark, Bren, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. It was nice to meet you Thanks for having both. us, folks. Thank you. Thanks for being you too. on. Thank you both. Okay, uh, Kelly, if folks want to appear on this show, what do they do? If you are an agency or an end user that has a Drupal story to share, please email us at partnerships at association.drupal.org and join us on Beyond the Build, Stories of Drupal Impact. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Thank you.